Why, hello there. My name is Mountain, and today I'd like to talk to you about this. And what is this, you might ask? Well, this, my friends, is the Dragonfly 30 Liter Ultra by ULA Equipment. As the name suggests, this is a 30 liter flying predatory insect designed primarily around travel and sometimes maybe outdoor use cases, manufactured in a very lightweight ultra fabric by ULA Equipment, the Utah USA based manufacturer of a range of ultra lightweight packs for hiking, plane travel and more. Now, while I always try to give an objective and detailed review, like all humans, I have certain personal preferences when it comes to things. And for the one bag travel use case, I have to say the Dragonfly strengths coincide very well with those preferences. So for example, it is a very lightweight bag coming in at only 850 grams for a nominal 30 liter capacity. And we'll get into that. And that means it has a very high um, kind of capacity to weight ratio, thanks to its material usage and this very efficient rectangular kind of clamshell panel loading style. It uses these advanced fabrics, the ULA, I'm sorry, the Ultra Fabric, um, to maintain a kind of general structure for easy packing and usage without needing to resort to like very heavy or superfluous kind of side walls. And it also has a very rigid, uh, very good strength and water resistance. It has this clamshell kind of, well, kind of panel loading clamshell-esque style uh, opening that gives you good access and to the internals of the bag. And it also has a separate laptop compartment, which means it's kind of useful for plane travel. And it has a kind of quasi quick access pocket here at the top back that lets you get inside uh, to your kind of on the go necessities. It's sized and proportioned accordingly to serve as a Goldilocks bag. That is to say, it's a kind of one bag travel bag and it can get your stuff from point A to point B and also serve capably as your EDC pack at the destination. And it has a competent load carry system, though it does have some limits on that um, within the constraints of maybe being a UL pack. And it can serve as a good crossover bag for both urban and maybe some lightweight outdoor use. Now, this isn't to say that even though there is a lot of things to like about this bag, that it's perfect. There's actually a lot of things that I think, or some things I think that um, might be areas for opportunities for improvement. Firstly, while it's nominally rated at 30 liters overall, the main capacity of the bag, this main compartment, is only really rated around 21 liters, and I believe it. Like, it actually um, can feel a little bit small. There's a larger size version that I'll show you in a moment here. Um, and I found that most of the things I could pack into this ostensibly 30 liter bag, I could also fit into much smaller bags like the Evergoods Civic Travel Bag 26. And there were multiple times when I had this thing packed out with what I thought was a reasonable load for a 30 liter bag and it kind of felt like it was bursting at the seams. So, you know, maybe it's better to think of this as a somewhat smaller bag than the actual 30 liters might imply. Secondly, the overall load carriage system on this has a recommended weight limit, I think of around 11 kilograms or so. And I found that to be true in practice, maybe even slightly lighter. Like when this thing tops out, it does kind of top out. Thirdly, there's a kind of general tightness or maybe kind of constraint on many of the pockets. This front mesh is really tight. These side pockets can be tight when the bag is filled up. Some of the internal pockets are tight and narrow. And that kind of provides or uh, makes for kind of a little bit more frictionful or more difficult kind of uh, usage uh, in daily life. And the zippers, um, while waterproof and high quality, are very frictionful. And I'll show you kind of how that factors into daily interactions with this bag, both on here and also on here a little bit. Um, and finally, maybe the bag has less usable internal organization. Um, and I'll show you that here in a second when I get into the overview of the bag um, than many of the competitors. And that means it's not really like a, the best bag for like EDC uh, usage. Like I did mention, it's a competent Goldilocks bag, but there are definitely others that do better at the kind of EDC part of you know, the Goldilocks bag, whereas this one I think leans more towards like the uh, travel bag style or maybe the outdoor type, type uh, style -y. And oh, sorry, I said one, I guess one more thing, not finally. While the body fabric, this ultra fabric and this ultra mesh or ultra stretch fabric is really good and high quality, there are some areas where I felt the other components felt cheaper, like the air mesh is kind of a generic commodity kind of solution. The buckles are not that great. I mean, they're, sorry, they're fine. They haven't broken on me or anything like that, but they don't feel that great. Some, some of the bungees and a little bit of like the, you know, like the zipper pulls or whatever. There are reasons why they, you know, say they made certain choices. But for me, sometimes they felt a little bit cheaper than maybe like what the body fabric and, and the, the main mesh uh, would seem to kind of otherwise uh, imply. So let's take a quick overview of the bag here. Um, it's got these bungees on the front. It's got a front uh, mesh stretch 
panel that you can put things into two side stretch water bottle pockets with top captive, meaning non-buckleable, non, non unbuckleable, non-removable uh, straps at the top, retention straps, if you will, a patch here and a, or a patch panel, I should say, which comes with a patch. You can get a patchless version if you want. Uh, on the back towards the top, you have a quick access pocket here and the lid, and you have a separate laptop compartment accessible from the outside here. Curved ergonomic shoulder straps, non-stowable, very simple back panel, one top grab handle. And then when we get into the main compartment here, kind of this panel loading pocket with two internal zippers and then a big simple uh, main compartment which has a couple of compression straps inside that I'll show you here in a minute. The bag itself uh, comes in a wide variety of sizes and colors and materials, etc. So this is the 30 liter size in the ultra fabric. There's also a 36 liter size here, which you can see is some, well, not somewhat considerably bigger, though otherwise maintains all the same features and such of the bag here. Um, it's available in a patch or patchless variant and in a variety of material ways. So this is the ultra fabric. There's also an X-Pack fabric, an Eco-Pack, an aerobic nylon version, and a couple of different colorways which sort of varies according to the material. Now the pricing also um, varies according to the chosen size of material way, but ranges from around $229 uh, for the base level, kind of 30 liter aerobic nylon version, all the way to like $320 for the 36 liter ultra version that I just showed you. On top of that, there's also an option uh, on all the packs to upgrade the base uh, sternum strap to this uh, Fidlock uh, magnetic buckle version, which is what I chose to do on this one. I'll talk about my feelings on that here in a minute. Um, and this particular bag, as I mentioned, is a 30 liter ultra with the patch in Ultra 400 TX Black Magic colorway with the upgraded for, uh, sternum strap. And it retailed for $309.98. And all of these are available on ulaequipment.com. Although some of these versions and variants may not always be in stock, so you have to kind of wait sometimes. And as usual, this bag was purchased with my own money. All opinions are my own. I've been using this bag for a couple of months, both for one bag travel, kind of a little bit of EDC and the Goldilocks context, and also like for crossover outdoor use. I just got back, um, those of you who follow the channel, I just got back from the Canadian Rockies two weeks in the, you know, the back country with this bag. It's kind of one of my primary uh, bags with me. So next, let's talk about who this bag is for and who it's not for. So for one bag travelers, as you might imagine here, this is kind of a great Goldilocks bag. It's very lightweight, very capable, and it carries a lot of stuff, and it's a good size for those of you who are experienced one bag travelers with a tightly dialed kit. It's also a good bag for crossover use, which is the term I use for like bags that are, <clears throat> you know, good for the EDC context, but they'll also take you out, you know, comfortably for day hikes, uh, lightweight, you know, um, outdoor use, et cetera here. Um, it's also obviously a great bag for the, the lightweight homies here. It's, an, it's a bag by a company called Ultralight Adventure Equipment. So it's, it's 850 grams. It's a really capable pack, uh, does a lot of great things. So it's a good, you know, lightweight bag for those of you who really kind of care about those things, sub one kilogram, etc. Now, who's this bag not for? And then we can get all into like the guts of this thing here. Uh, it's not the best bag for dedicated EDC use. There's not like, there's not a lot of affordances for like places to put your business papers, man. I mean, there's a laptop compartment, but you know, that's kind of uh, um, for reasons we'll talk about. And beyond that, there's not really anything else. Like there's just this big wide open space. There's not, these are too narrow to actually really get your business papers. You could throw it at the bottom there, but it gets wrinkled because there's no like back pocket inside of this main compartment here. Um, unless you're carrying like a ton of bulky stuff like shoes and gym clothes or whatever on the daily, this is not the best EDC bag. It's also ironically not the best bag for maximalists because it is a bit smaller than the 30 liter. Like 30 liters is usually a huge kind of like EDC uh, size bag. It's, you know, it's a, in the upper third. It's not the maximum size for one bag travel. But like if you're a, if you're a maximalist here, this bag doesn't carry as much as you would think for 30 liters. It also doesn't maximize like the full 40, 45 liter capacity you can usually get for one bag travel bags. So if you're carrying a lot of stuff, this isn't gonna be the right choice. The 36 liter variant that I showed you earlier might be a better choice. Uh, the problem with that is you're probably gonna start topping out the limits of the load carriage system, which hasn't been upgraded on the 36 liter versus the 30 liter. And finally, maybe as a sub variant of the EDC use case, urban commuters, you can carry a laptop in here, but like, forget about, I mean, sorry, you can throw a tablet and a notebook and a book and your devices in here, like headphones, or I'll show you that all in a little bit here. I got even a Lenovo Legion Go thrown in here and a camera, but 
Um, it just sort of rattles around. There's not a lot of padding. There, sorry, there's zero padding on the sidewalls because there are no sidewalls. It's just the, the material there. So it kind of, you know, doesn't have a great way of carrying and using like the kind of devices you'd be used to in an ED, sorry, in an urban commuting type use case. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the design here. Now, the first thing you notice is it's generally a very e efficient rectangular prism kind of shape. It's like a kind of a big rectangular prism, though there is some slight sloping there. You can see you got curvature at the bottom here. You got curvature at the top plate here. Oh, uh, kind of some slight trapezoidal kind of shaping here. So uh, generally a very efficient space with some like kind of like human touches to kind of make it a little bit gentler, not just like a square box on your bag here. That's a bag after my own heart. I like very efficient bags with kind of the whose space maximize, maximize the usable space in there. Also, it's only 850 grams for this, which is a very high capacity to size ratio, even though, as I said, like this bag holds maybe a little bit less than you might expect. Um, the full 30 liters, if you look on their website, they kind of like break down how they think of it. They're like 21 or 22 liters for the main compartment. And then they put like some, I don't think very realistic amounts for like the side water bottle pockets in this really tight front stretch pocket. So, you know, overall it's a holds less than you might expect, but still pretty good. It can usually stand up on its own, depending on how you have it loaded out. Um, it has no excess sidewalls. It has no sidewalls at all. It just relies on the structure of the material to kind of keep it up. That makes for really good, um, easy packing. Um, also the structure as well, kind of some of these curvatures help provide some kind of like structure when, you know, you're just loading the bag, you got it flip, flipped open like this, even though you don't have those, you know, stiff panels or whatever, it just all kind of, you know, stands up on its own. Um, provides for like good, you know, access and packing and all that. It also fits under most airline seats. Uh, depends on your particular class and seat and all that, but usually it'll, it'll definitely go in vertical, like kind of this way. And then you can sometimes even get it in there kind of like horizontally because like there's some gentle sloping in there. Again, depends on your particular seat here. It is designed for travel, but it has a clear outdoor inspiration. You notice like you know, ULA equipment has their roots in outdoor kind of hiking adventure packs or whatever. So you can see you got like the bungees and you got like, um, you know, some of like these paracord poles here that don't jingle. Um, well, they're not even paracord. They're just not cord, <laughs> not even para, non-para, just cord. Um, you also end up with like some things like, you know, like the patch. You can get a patchless version if you want here. Um, you know, the side water bottle pockets, these captive things, the sort of very aggressive kind of... Um, um, curved uh, shoulder straps that kind of give it a bit of an outdoorsy vibe, which I think I like it. But if you're kind of more of a minimalist, you want like, you're like, oh, this could be the perfect sleek, you know, ultra minimalist pack or whatever. Um, you know, you get the patchless version, you can remove the bungee cords. Um, you're still kind of stuck with the shoulder straps kind of be a little bit more, you know, aggressive than maybe you might want. But anyway, uh, overall, like outdoorsy inspired one bag travel, which for me is something I vibe with. When we look at the materials of the bag, like I mentioned, there's a ton of different color, uh, material ways and color ways and all that. I think personally, for me, if you can afford it, the one to get is going to be the Ultra 400 TX. Uh, because of some of the structural properties that I mentioned, there's also like X-Pack versions as well, um, which I think will give you most of that. And I think they might come in a slightly lower price point here. Um, I've talked a lot about the Ultra material in my previous review around the uh, Air Day Sling 3 Ultra. So you can go ahead and check that out if you want to know a little bit more about that. Uh, the TLDR is kind of a strong, lightweight and waterproof synthetic material, similar. It's in the same category as like Dyneema. Although I think the uh, Ultra is supposed to have more abrasion resistance. There is kind of a ripstop um, layer uh, or diamond layer for tear resistance that does become more visible over time as the bag wears. Though I think the diamond pattern on this one isn't as visible as like I saw on the Air, uh, Air uh, Ultra series of bags that I showed in that other review here. Now the front and the side water bottle pockets are made of something called Ultra Stretch which they describe on their website as an advanced four-way stretch mesh woven, and I quote here, with the highest quality fibers for performance and longevity. Seems to be a mix of things like nylon 6.6, Lycra, and ultra PE polyethylene, and has some DWR coating on there. Uh, we'll talk about that, and when I talk about these individual pockets, it's a very robust mesh, it's a robust material. Waterproof zippers on the main kind of access ports all around here, um, generally good. Um, in terms of high degree of water resistance, though a lot of friction and use. Um, this bag itself, 
no taped seams, but very good water resistance. When I was in the Rockies for a couple of weeks, you know, I set this down in wet snow and mud several times. Not only did it brush right off, you can see there's not really any staining down here at the bottom. <clears throat> Nothing really got inside. As long as you don't like throw it in a lake or leave it fully soaking in a monsoon, you should be fine. The only last thing I'll say about the materials before we move on is whilst I think, as I said, the body fabric and this mesh fabric is really good. There are a couple areas where I feel like they might have cheaped out a little bit, like the cord. Um, I know they said they did it for silence reasons, but it feels pretty cheap. Um, some of the uh, webbing, it's not, sorry, it's not low quality. It just feels a little bit more commodity. The plastic buckles, they feel a little bit commodity. I don't want to use the word cheap, commodity. The air mesh is absolutely a commodity solution. Um, and... That's sometimes that's okay, right? Like, you know, sometimes good enough is good enough. Not everything has to be like, you know, hype beast, super high tech materials or whatever. I just want to kind of call out that sometimes that contrast against like the, the more advanced fabric, um, you know, was a little bit striking. So in terms of load carriage on this bag, a couple of things here. First thing and the most important thing I want to convey is this bag, I think, has a very clear limit as to how much weight it can support. That limit is somewhere around 10 to 11 kilograms before it gets pretty uncomfortable. And that is because of how the load carry system is built on this bag and just sort of like the realities of, you know, like ultralight equipment when you don't have, you know, frame stays and such in there. Um, but as long as you're staying around under 11 kilograms, which I think if you're getting an ultralight bag for this price, you probably can easily do that if you're conscious about what you're getting, uh, you should be fine here. Load carriage uh, consists of this simple top handle, simple sewn over uh, webbing, strap webbing, a little bit of a foam core, very large, you know, um, entrance here, easy to grab with or without gloves. Um, it's not really low profile because it's always just out here, but when you look at the bag from the front, th because it just sort of like falls behind, you'll never really see the handle um, poking out there. So, you know, I guess it, you could say it's out of sight at least. Due to the rearward kind of placement, when you carry the bag by this, it obviously will cant uh, heavily. The foam kind of core of this helps a little bit with comfort. Um, you mainly just use this to move the bag from one place to another. And you'll notice like I'm kind of supporting the bag like this because there are no other handles anywhere on the back. I wish there were just one more handle just like on the side here. Like you see a lot of manufacturers these days have one on the side, even with the water bottle pocket, it would just make for so much easier portaging and movement of the bag, especially cause like this carry handle is up here. So like it's not, you know, anyway. Um, I wouldn't want to carry the bag by this handle all the time, but it's fine for like the occasional movement. Flipping it around and looking at the back of the bag here, you've got this um, relatively thin foam frame sheet. There's actually two layers here because there's the um, laptop compartment. So you have internally a foam layer here. It's very flexy. And then you have like on the other side of the laptop, you have this other foam layer here. And they're very thin. They don't provide... They provide like some protection against sharp things in the internal compartment poking against your back. They'll keep the bag upright and give it some structure when it's empty, but it doesn't really provide a lot of like load transference or support. It's kind of what you would expect in an ultralight bag here, um, but it has these limits. And that's, you know, I talk about the limits of the load carriage system. I think this is one of the main reasons for that. Um, it just doesn't, you know, provide much support. There's no uh, frame sheet or anything like that. It is relatively comfortable as long as you stay within those kind of carry limits here. The back surface itself has <clears throat> this kind of U-shaped foam. There's an additional layer. So there's a foam frame sheet and then there's an additional layer of foam for these raised panels. This is to try and ostensibly give you some, you know, uh, air, uh, air, airflow here. And then there's a big foam area here that kind of lays against the small of your back here. Um, better than a plain flat back, not as good as the best in class, but generally like I'm kind of skeptical of like how much airflow you can get on a back that's against your back when you're really kind of exerting yourself. Now, other thing is like this air mesh is kind of rough. I mean, it's commodity, it's not bad. You know, got, you know, all the things you expect, nice uh, kind of biased tape or piping or whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, kind of against the edges for comfort, but like it's just a commodity air mesh. The foam itself is a little bit denser than this foam here, or maybe it's the same, I can't, it feels a little bit denser. But overall, like, you know, it's not, in a, it's not best in class, but it's good enough. It will 
rough up more delicate clothing. So don't wear it like on a merino wool sweater, but like for normal clothing, it'll be okay. I wouldn't really want to wear this on bare skin. Not so much of a problem, I guess, on the back because I don't hike without a shirt, but uh, maybe on the shoulders uh, on a hot, sweaty day. And on the shoulder straps, it might be a little bit rougher than you would like. Speaking of the shoulder straps, let's get into them. They're made of a combination of like the ultra fabric and then like what feels like some normal nylon fabric and then back to the ultra fabric at the very tippy top bottom there or whatever. Not sure why they chose to implement it this way. Maybe they're trying to avoid like the wrinkle lines. You can already see there on here on the fabric, on the nylon part, like from just kind of the constant contouring of the straps like that. The straps are appropriately sized in length and feature a fairly, erg for the size here, and feature a fairly aggressive ergonomic curvature which I found to be sufficiently ergonomic. Um, but they're not very thick um, at all. Uh, they're very thin straps, actually, I would say. And the foam core, which is inside of them, is actually not as dense as I would have expected. And I think the overall thinness of these straps works well with this degree of kind of aggressive curvature because it really lets it kind of wrap around your body. And to a certain extent, I won't say lock it in, but it does give a very stable purchase on the body. And if the straps were thicker, I think that would be a little bit more uncomfortable because like, it's just kind of how it wraps around there. Um, and just very flexible like that. So that's good. Um, unlike a lot of other very thin and broad straps, these don't have like a plastic layer or kind of a hard layer on the top to kind of to distribute weight over the foam. And because it is like a very thin foam, um, I think this is where uh, the other part of why this kind of bag tops out at a certain kind of weight carriage limit. Because while they're comfortable and, you know, flexy and soft um, to wear with a moderate load, like when you overload it, like because it just doesn't have that much advanced weight distribution, you don't have that second layer construction, you don't have like that, a more, you know, kind of efficient load transference on the back panel or more support. Like it just gets kind of overwhelmed and it's kind of uncomfortable here. Um, I think that, again, it's a 30 liter bag, but it's a small one in terms of 30 liters. And, you know, most people using this will be kind of advanced, more advanced packers, I think. So it should be all right. But like, you know, if you think about it, if you have a computer in here, um, like a 15 inch laptop, that's like one in 1.8 kilos, maybe more. A mirrorless camera, that's like 1.3 kilos with a lens. Maybe a water bottle with a liter of water, that's a kilogram right there. Like you can easily start pushing into that 10, 11 kilogram uh, size before you even start adding in clothes and a dop kit and a tech kit and book or whatever, blah, blah, blah. So just something to kind of keep in mind. The back of the shoulder straps, as I mentioned, feature that same kind of rough, well, not rough, but just kind of general commodity air mesh. It is the exact same thing as I mentioned with the back panel here. Good enough is good enough. It works fine in most cases. Maybe not the most pleasant against bare skin or against delicate clothing, but you know, I don't think everything in the world needs to be like crazy space age custom made materials for hype beasts where you got like NASA inspired or whatever. Like this is great, it's, it's fine. Um, the front of the shoulder straps is pretty interesting. They feature daisy chained webbing. ULA equipment sells separately a variety of like add on, you know, uh, water bottle uh, retaining bungees and like a phone pocket or whatever. You can get like aftermarket ones. These clip into here, they give you a good place to kind of put them here. This part features, the lower part features a rail uh, for the removable uh, sternum strap. And uh, I'll talk about that in a second here. And then just the bottom of the <clears throat> of the shoulder straps is just like a normal captive um, strap with a little loop through there. So you can kind of easily adjust them to hold their place pretty well. Um, very easy to tighten and to loosen. So good stuff there. All right. You all know the deal now. I'm a certified member of the sternum strap squad. So let's talk about the sternum strap in probably more excruciating detail than anybody really cares about. The lower third features this very simple straight rail system. It's a very common kind of solution to how you would attach or a, a detachable sternum strap. Um, I'm glad that it has a sternum strap. There's a couple things to mention about the sternum strap. First of all, while this bag has the magnetic fidlock uh, buckle sternum strap here, uh, I was trying to <laughs> release it upside down here, which is great. No, it doesn't come with that by default. It comes with like a simple clip in one that this one is a 1999 US dollar, a $20 US option to upgrade from the default sternum strap to this one. Um, 
that seems a little bit insane to me. I don't usually talk about pricing too much on this channel because everybody's pricing valid paradigm and valuation paradigm, blah, 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 is, you know, differs. But like the delta behind, like the only thing they're replacing is this buckle and this buckle is not $20. Um, they do spend a lot of words on their website talking about why, you know, like, they're like, if you have a pacemaker, don't, you know, don't use the magnetic buckle or something like that. So that's a good reason not to have this by default if that's what you want to do. But it's crazy that they're charging $19.99 just to replace the buckle on there. That's kind of whatever. It, I paid for it, but it kind of rubbed me the wrong way because it sort of seems like such an egregious amount of nickel and dime for what is like, you know, a very small component. The bag itself is, you know, depending on what version you're getting, like that could easily be like what one tenth the price just for that buckle there. Um, secondly, um, I actually had the sternum strap work its way off of this rail once by, by itself when I was kind of going up a mountain. Um, I've never had that happen with this kind of attachment method before. So I just think it was a freak thing. Um, but I just kind of keep a careful eye on it, something that I wanted to kind of mention there. It might be just designed, you know, it might just be maybe because of the combination of the flexiness of the strap or whatever. Maybe it was just like a freak, you know, accident or something like that. But just something to mention there. Um, overall, though, uh, very straightforward. Um, there's no elastic part in here, but it's easy to kind of cinch it shut. Obviously easy to remove and attach. Um, good, confident sternum strap. The next part of the load carriage uh, is these two are these two little loops down at the bottom here, which you can use to attach a separately sold uh, hip belt, which attaches with simple gate clips. I don't usually use hip belts on most bags, especially not a bag of this size and, and, and kind of capacity. So I didn't buy or test it. That said, I'm a little bit dubious of how much actual load transference you're going to be able to get out of it. Um, because of, as I mentioned, just kind of lack of kind of load transfer here on this back panel. Um, and because of the soft frame sheet, uh, I think it'd be better to think of, and also like these attachment points generally just have some limitations of how much load they can transfer through them. I think it's better to think of this as like a option for like a stabilizing kind of hip belt. Um, you know, I also like though that it's, it's there as an option. Um, it's low profile doesn't, you know, it's not in the way you don't see it if you're not using it. Um, but it gives options for people who want to do the hip belt it makes more sense on the 36 liter version, I think, cause you could really get that one kind of packed out there to a pretty heavy weight if that's what you want. All right, friends. So now we're going to get into what you really want to see, which is the main compartments of the bag here, starting with the quick access pocket at the top. It is quite large It's the whole, this is the top of the bag. This whole area is the quick access pocket or the quick stash pocket here, single one way waterproof zipper, runs the full width of the bag. Usually I find opening it as a two-handed affair. You'll see I have one kind of hand either stabilizing or whatever. When the bag's fully pack packed up, you can kind of like operate it with one hand, but when it's not fully packed up, like because of the stiffness of the fabric and the stiffness of this um, zipper, you're gonna find that it kind of yanks the bag back and forth in here. Once it's open, it reveals this very large, um, once it's open, it reveals this very large dump pocket here. We're going to start with kind of getting out what I have in here and I'll show you the contents. There is a uh, key uh, carabiner thing. Um, sorry, this loop doesn't come. There's a little key carabiner thing that comes with it. That's where I have my keys in here. Um, then I have a kind of Marvis toothbrush kit for like on the go tooth brushing, I guess, um, a pen, because you never know when you got to write something, some hand cream, because, uh, you know, I was just out in the Rockies with this, and my hands were getting chapped every time I took off the gloves. And beyond that, you just have this huge, big dump area. It's mounted parallel to the top of the uh, bag, the kind of lid of the bag, which I'll show you the pros and cons of that in a minute. The pros are basically a huge capacity there. There's nothing else inside of there. There's sort of this gray, I guess you could call it contrast lining in there. And in the corner, you have this little loop, which comes with this little ULA equipment branded aluminum carabiner. And that's sort of it there. Um, I liked that it had this big area here. It was very handy and it's very easy to just load and throw stuff into there, as you might imagine. I liked the loop for the key uh, key retainer here in a second or uh, here in the corner. I found that that was really useful for kind of keeping your keys organized. Now the downsides here are like, because it is just this big open capacity, you can't really throw things like your keys and your phone in here without running the risk of your phone getting scratched. Unless you have like one of those, I guess, portfolio cases that like covers the screen or something like that. And it is kind of a big area. So it's easy to like get in and out, even with the gloves outdoors when it's kind of down here next to you in the airport or whatever. But you can also kind of like, you just, you know, it's sort of 
contrast, but it, it gets pretty dark in there. And so you kind of rummage, you can have a lot of stuff in there. So you just kind of rummaging around. So that can be a little bit inconvenient, but overall, uh, really good stuff. Um, I was, <clears throat> maybe the last word to say here is like this, <laughs> this little carabiner clip. I was really surprised. At first I was like, oh, this feels kind of like an unrefined solution. This is how it comes out of the box. I'm like, oh, they just clipped a third party carabiner. And I feel like something I would do like as a hack. Um, or a user would do as a hack. Um, I was like, man, they could have just, in, you know, for this price, they should have just invested in designing a key leash. But then I started thinking about, you know, companies like Bellroy or whatever, which like they design their own key leashes. Many of them are terrible. So I'm like, this actually is, even though it seems a little bit, you know, kind of like, oh, they just clipped a carabiner on there. It actually works better and is a little bit more refined than a lot of like the cheaper th first party, you know, um, key leash solutions out there. I, you kind of feel the cottage uh, industry nature of this manufacturer and things like that, but it, it was effective. So good for that. Side water bottle pockets are next. There's two, one on each side. Let me show you what you can put inside of them. Okay, uh, well, let's start with uh, a water bottle pocket. This, or sorry, a water bottle for the water bottle pocket. This is a 18 ounce, whatever that is in milliliters. Um, water bottle fits in there. You can fit like a one liter um, Nalgene in there if you want. Um, and on the other side, we've got a pretty lightweight tripod. Every time I think that, you know, every once in a while I'll go looking for like a even lighter weight tripod than I already have that's still like moderately competent. This is the Fujing Obo N255C Carbon 8X. Wow, that's a mouthful. Uh, tripod. This is super, it's like 600 something grams. It's crazy. Uh, that just goes inside of there like this. Um, I'll talk about these straps here in a minute. Uh, but um, yeah, you can see you can easily carry these things inside of the uh, side water bottle pockets. They're made out of that ultra mesh that I talked about earlier. They have like a kind of elastic layer at the top, which helps with both retention uh, and also just kind of durability. They feel quite durable, to be honest with you. Like you can see, like I carried this tripod exactly like this for two weeks, basically every day, out in, you know, eight, some eight, 10 hours a day, no marks left, no tearing, no ripping or whatever. This is good, robust stuff. There's no hole at the bottom either. That means you can put small things like your USB batteries or you know whatever, and you have pretty good retention on those items. Like a smaller item you might put inside of here, um, you know it, it retains it pretty well. These are really tall and deep pockets, so you're not going to have your water bottle fall out. You're not going to have the small things fall out. Good stuff. Now the maybe criticisms I have of these pockets are. Because there's no pleating or gusseting, like you see, it's just flat. Like you're relying entirely on the stretch of this ultra mesh material for being able to get things in and out of there. It's really tight. It's really, it's robust, but it's really tight. And you can see even like when I've got the bag packed out, like you are fighting to get stuff into there. Um, you forget about trying to like stuff it in and out while it's on your back. You're gonna have to take it off, you know, set it down, work two hands in and out, you know, like one hand to yank it out. Like, so it's, it, it, it's just sort of um, the trade-offs you make for this kind of uh, material and this kind of water bottles, uh, pockets. When you take things out, they are, I mean, they're still obviously noticeable because of the different materials, but they're relatively low profile, especially when you view them from the front, even though there's no like gusseting or pleating or anything. The other kind of obvious thing to talk about here on the side is this compression, I, I call them reten retention straps. They are non-removable. You can probably work it out through this buckle, but it would be kind of really annoying and painful to get in and out. So I wouldn't do it regular. In fact, I've never done it. It would just be annoying to do. Um, there's no buckle here, which at first I was kind of like, oh, that's a little bit annoying. Cause you saw like, for example, when I fought to get this thing in here, you take a tripod or an umbrella or walking, hiking sticks or whatever. You kind of have to kind of jam it in here and you have to kind of loosen up the strap. And then there's no elasticity. So you're kind of fighting to get it over there. Then you tighten it in like this. I was like, oh, a buckle would be so much faster. What I ended up liking about this system though is because there is no buckle, like often when you're carrying a tripod, and I talked about this in my recent review of the Kiboko Gura, or the Gura Gear Kiboko 30, like you get like this plastic buckle. It's like, it's usually they're pretty big. It's kind of like breaking against the vertical poles of the tripod or whatever in a way that puts a lot of stress on it. It's kind of uncomfortable. This one is much more contoured because obviously there's no like plastic buckle like that. You can ostensibly, I think, use these for top side compression if you really wanted to. Um, I mean, in reality, that's not, you know, you probably want two down there, you want one down here and one up there if you really want a compression. So I really think of these as retention straps more than anything. I, I like that they're kind of permanently attached. And like I said, they grew on me um, for their simplicity. 
uh, even though there's a little bit of friction sometimes in their use and they greatly obviously enhance the usability of what you have you know these side water bottle pockets because you can put taller things in there and kind of keep it retained in there and i'll talk about how they handle compression on this bag once we get it to the main compartment here Okay, so next, let's talk about the front mesh of this bag here. Um, it has this front zipper pocket here, which also has the ultra mesh in here. I'll show you what I have inside of here, first of all. I have like a folder with some folded up papers and then like a, like a, just a mesh pocket to like hold like my receipts or whatever. Here I have a little mask inside of there. This is the only real place I found other than maybe the laptop compartment to keep business papers man. Um, they have to be folded up and it's it's tight like i'll okay same kind of like no there's no gusseting same kind of principle as like the water bottle pockets is applied here in the design of this no stretch i'm oh, sorry there's stretch obviously but there's no gusseting no pleating so you're relying entirely on the stretch of this fairly like tight mesh to get things in and out of but on top of that because of how the front panel is designed not to take up the full width of the bag it, it's it's actually a really narrow, like you can see, this is the entirety of the opening to this area. That's pretty narrow. Um, often with like, you know, if you see like a front kind of stretch mesh pocket on an outdoor bag, you usually are able to stuff like a shell inside of there or stuff like water bottles. You can maybe get a water bottle in here. It's gonna be tight. It's gonna be awkward. I did not have any success really getting shells inside of here because of this narrow opening. And the narrow opening obviously is not stretchy so because the zipper itself is not stretchy so in reality i found myself just kind of stuffing like a couple of folded travel docks or something inside of there not really using this area for very much um it didn't really meaningfully expand capacity uh in practical everyday terms for me so i, I feel like this area was not as useful the stretch mesh was not as useful as maybe i hoped it would be and maybe that also contributes to sort of that perceived delta between the rated literage of 30 liters and the actual practical usable capacity that I found uh, in this bag here. There's also obviously these bungees on here. They are also kind of tight. I mean, they're bungees, so like, you know, there's elasticity in them um, with almost no play. The, the biggest problem I found is like, there's just not that much excess um, play in the bungees here, which limits kind of what you can do with these now, um, or do comfortably with these. One of the most useful um, things about having external kind of straps or things like that, I think, is that you can carry an extra shell or like a layer, especially if you're going from like a warmer place to a colder place or vice versa, where you need a shell in one area, but you don't need it in the other, but you can't just like, you know, not have one. Um, you can just usually roll it up and put it on here, or I guess like a yoga mat, if you're carrying a yoga mat for whatever reason on your international travels. Um, let's show you how I actually use this with with something like this this is the arcteryx gamma mx uh hoodie um I, I i took this as sort of my shell when i was up in the canadian rockies uh in this most recent trip here very good kind of you know like all purpose kind of shell or whatever uh or well soft shell for you know shoulder seasons i should say you know roll it up like this this is not a particularly large shell and you know i found like i mean you can get it in here <laughs> Um, definitely it felt tight um, and it left marks on the soft shell itself which is you know fine like I'm not too fussy about that but like it, it was a kind of a tight um, you know interaction I got this loosened up all the way and you can kind of see like it, it's okay it's not at all bad and many would say this is exactly what you're supposed to be able to do with a bungee um, I did find that, uh, and I loosened it up a little bit actually, uh, as I've been, because I've been using it like this for like two weeks or so, more actually. Um, so it's loosened up a bit, but in the beginning it was really tight. And on the plus side, it's not gonna fall out. Uh, on the not plus side, it just felt like a little bit tight, especially if you have stuff inside of here in the, the front panel, like it just kind of overall, like, you know, forget about trying to like get your stuff in and out of this front panel at, at this point here. Um, <clears throat> this is not necessarily a bad part of it, but I just want to kind of highlight that there's an overall tightness maybe that you may not expect. Flipping the bag around, laptop compartment in the back here, single waterproof or water resistant zipper. Uh, again, two handed affair. I have in here like a 13 inch M1 MacBook Air. You can fit up to a 15 inch MacBook Air Pro inside of there. Um, 
any normal size laptop will fit. A super thick gaming laptop will not fit. There's a good false bottom on here, like good distance on there. So your laptop's definitely protected from drops. I already kind of covered like there's two layers of foam, one on this side and one on the back side. So it tends to kind of protect it from pokey bits or whatever. Um, you, there's nothing else inside of there. There's no, not really any independent dimension. There's no additional pockets for tablets or whatever. You might be able to cram a tablet and a laptop, a thin laptop in here. You will feel it. It'll kind of protrude out here because it's not really any, it's just sewn flat. There's no independent dimension for the laptop compartment there. I already previously mentioned you can get your business papers, man. Inside of here, if you um, have nowhere else to put them, it's very uncomfortable. It'll come, they'll get, you know, come in and out with the laptop if you've got them in a kind of folder or whatever. It's easy for them to kind of get stuffed in the bottom when you're stuffing the laptop in there really quickly. Like your papers can get stuffed at the bottom and crinkled or whatever because there's no separate like divider or anything like that. So then your business will be all wrinkly and people will be like, man, what's up with these papers, man. Anyway, um, I usually carry just an M4 uh, iPad Pro in here with the keyboard cover to set, save on weight since this is a lightweight bag. But you know, you can also carry, like I showed you, like a 13 inch MacBook Air or whatever like that. Um, overall, simple, functional, um, good. And the external access is really great for going through security at the airport. Okay, and now let's talk about the main compartment of the bag. This is the last remaining section that we have to get into. It opens with this kind of panel loading opening. Uh, I already talked about the front part of it and some of the kind of, you know, issues I had with that. Um, you open it up here. On the inside, you have two uh, mesh pockets. It's a bit of a rougher mesh. Um, no stretch, really. Robust, certainly. Not really a lot of independent dimension in these pockets. Maybe slightly, maybe a little bit of allowance here and kind of how the bottom one at least is sewn. Standard one-two split. Uh, like you often find in kind of like, you know, bags that have internal lid pockets like this. Top pocket um, kind of right goes, it's actually a little bit bigger than the bottom pocket. It goes above the seam, the zipper line, though this is not really usable space in practical everyday use. Um, it, it helps that it has these, it helps that there's two of them. It helps that the top one is conveniently located near the top. Um, and the reason I mention that is like, it is relatively secure. So you can unzip this top thing. You can unzip a second zipper and get like your wallet or something out of there. Um, so that's that's handy. That, that helps with, you know, just kind of security, but also uh, practicality here. Um, now, there's a bunch of negatives on these, or some negatives anyway. Uh, I already talked about a little bit of the roughness of this, but like they're, they're just narrow. Like the openings are narrow, same as this front opening because of like how narrow the panel itself is. Um, like you're just limited by how big this opening is. A lot of the other ones, like if you look at like an Evergoods clamshell bag or and not just Evergoods, any, any kind of like air or whatever, like they run the whole width of the, you know, of the, of the front panel. These do not, like these are, are definitely more narrow openings. On top of that, because there's no mesh, like that just means this is sometimes a little bit tight to get into. Um, opening and closing is generally like a two-handed uh, kind of affair uh, here. Um, and for me, uh, that kind of inhibits sometimes like how much I wanted to use these or not use these. Um, the, when you put stuff inside of, um, them and you put stuff in this front pocket, you sometimes end up with, uh, you know, a little bit of a floppy or conversely like a rigid kind of affair where the whole panel kind of like flip flops like this. Now this is not at all uncommon with panel loading bags. Like, you're usually making a trade-off of like enhanced capacity and functionality for like a floppy, you know, heavy kind of experience that's sometimes a little bit inconvenient because like, you know, you can't, I don't know. The problem with this bag is like, I, I, you, you still get that kind of floppy or rigid, depending on what you have inside of it, experience, but you don't actually get meaningfully enhanced capacity to the degree you might expect. Like, so let's talk about what I have inside of here. Uh, wallet, chapstick, uh, coins, uh, earbuds and an AirPod or uh, an Apple Air tag, and then down here I have like a mask, uh, USB battery, and then like a notebook, which is actually kind of annoying to get in and out of here with the pen. That's not a ton of stuff. You could get more stuff inside of there, but um, it's just sort of annoying to get in and out of here, which is kind of why I tend not to overpack it too much because then it gets more so. And then I already talked about how basically I felt that the front mesh panel didn't really hold that much additional stuff. So you're kind of trading 
I don't know, like you're kind of getting this un less pleasant kind of opening experience, but not usually getting like the enhanced ca carrying capacity that you would get in another kind of panel loading um, style bag. Okay, enough about the panel for right now. Let's talk about the contents of this bag here. I have this loaded out how I just had it on a trip. Uh, this is a Lenovo Legion Go inside of a Waterfield case. I kind of put it in here so you can kind of see like, you know, you can fit a decent amount of stuff in here, even though it does have some limits on the capacity. Uh, this is like my little car kit with like my uh, foldable sunglasses and like a cable so I can connect my phone to the car. Navi, this is my tech kit. Uh, inside of here, just, you know, a little charger and a couple of cables and whatnot. Uh, I have a Sony A6700 with a 16 to 55 F2.8 uh, lens on there. No case on that one. Uh, Matador flat pack dop kit. Uh, just like a bag with some doodads and some outdoor gear or whatever. Um, this is my other kind of miscellaneous bag. It's a North Face pouch. This is the Air. This is the Air. Um, I think it's called Zip Pouch Small. Uh, this is a North Face Japan uh, zip pouch, uh, which I just have like my normal interior EDC miscellaneous, sorry, miscellaneous, uh, miscellaneous kind of goods for like at the hotel or whatever. Hair iron, because you got to look good or else it don't matter. And then finally, <clears throat> a uh, handmade um, Dyneema uh, packing cube with all my clothes in there. So putting that aside for a second, you can see now the main capacity of the bag. Nothing inside except for these compression straps, which are non-removable. And I kind of wish they were because I didn't really use them that much in the beginning, though sometimes I use them. We'll talk about that in a second here. And then there's no side walls, but as I mentioned, the structure of the bag and the design of the patterning kind of helps keep it rigid when you're loading or unloading it. Um, not really a contrast lining per se, though the walls are white. Uh, so that does help a little bit. A couple things here. First of all, you're gonna notice the quick access pouch at the top is not bar tacked or attached at the top here, like you usually find with horizontal quick access pouches. Uh, quick access um, pockets, not pouches. And so you get like, this weird sag. It actually really takes up a ton of space. And it's annoying when you're trying to get into the bag and you've got to fight, you know, this thing, things get caught sometimes in the little kind of fake gusset at the top here. Anyway, that was sort of like an annoying miss here. Um, nothing else inside the main capacity of the bag here. Let me go back really briefly and you can already see the issue I'm talking about. Um, the bag gets doesn't do well when it's not fully loaded out when it comes to like trying to open this thing so see this 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 happens you got to go and then you got to take your other thing and then like this and then you want to zip it back up so you're like okay oh you can't do this because you know so you got to hold it like this but you can't do this so you got to set it down you flip it on the snow and you go like this okay now we're going to flip this one and like this and then oh look it's caught here so this is kind of the issue uh, i had with um this kind of panel access when the bag wasn't fully loaded out it probably was what i think is the biggest annoyance or kind of shortcoming of this bag if you can get over that, then I think otherwise, you know, um, most of the other things are kind of, you know, not that big of a deal. So these compression straps here um, are how they um, deal with compression on this bag since there's only this one top external retaining strap here. Let's take this packing cube in here, stuff it in the bottom, and you kind of lay this on top here and then cinch tight. And you can see you actually relieve uh, a lot of the, the, the pressure against the external capacity. You have like this internal compression system that works you know, all right, actually. Putting some more stuff in here, you can see you can also do that here, you know, compress this down more. It can sometimes help a little bit with things, smaller things rattling around. You can see you got a good, decent compression and then zipping shut. And you're like, oh, we don't have as much pressure pushing against this. Like there's actually, you know, it's, a, it's internally compressed. The challenge with that is, and I think kind of the reason why, like, sometimes I use these and as I didn't is, this is not everything I normally would carry. If you take something like a camera and these little pockets, well, obviously I'm not going to cinch the compression straps down across my camera because that would be uh, very bad. Don't do that. Um, if I had like the Lenovo Legion Go, which I showed here in a second, I wouldn't cinch it down across that. That would not be good for that. So, you know, there are limits to this kind of internal compression system which you wouldn't normally experience if you were compressing from the outside in. Um, I don't think it's bad. Uh, just kind of pointing out kind of like the pros and cons or the trade-offs of this sort of thing. Now, 
I did mention earlier in the beginning that this is not the best bag for kind of EDC or com commuter use. Let me show you why. So here we have like a book, a notebook, and a tablet, um, which I think is a pretty common thing to carry in an EDC use case or commuter use case. There's no slip pocket in the back like you usually find with most kind of bags. So you just sort of like throw this thing in there. And, <laughs> and then it just does this. And then you kind of flip this thing here and then we're gonna fight with the panel again. And you can see this is the, the floppy of the floppiness when it's not fully loaded out. And then there's no bottom, there's no bottom padding here. So that's your tablet smashing against the ground. And then that's it smashing against here or your notebook or whatever. And there's just everything kind of just falling in this big pile at the bottom. So I think that's the kind of reason why I don't think this is the best uh, EDC or kind of like commuter type bag, but I still think this makes a competent Goldilocks bag if you're only using it in that kind of EDC capacity at the destination. And like I said, also like it's good for outdoor. So like, you know, there's trade-offs here. In a future revision, I'd love to see like, a, you know, pocket sewn against the back there. And so kind of summarizing this bag, like I think there's a lot of things to like about this bag. The materials are great. The structure is great. The size is great. Good capacity to weight ratio and a lot of like, you know, good affordances for one bag travel. And it's a decent Goldilocks kind of combination one bag travel EDC bag plus does really good in the outdoors. Some of the downsides are, as I mentioned, some of the friction around or fussiness around this panel loading access when the bag is not filled up. Some of the tightness around some of the main pockets inside and outside. Um, not the best dedicated EDC bag because of the lack of protection and kind of additional kind of, you know, pockets or lack thereof inside of the bag. But still overall, like this is a bag that has a, you know, solid place in my one bag travel rotation. I really like it. It takes a ton of the things that I think are boxes I look for in, in a one bag travel bag. So uh, definitely worth, I think, checking out. Now, that having been said, if you're in the market for a bag like this, what are some other bags you might want to consider? Evergood Civic Travel Bag 26, much heavier bag, uh, but uh, one of my all-time favorite one bag travel Goldilocks bags. I did a full review of this on my channel. I'll link it, uh, check that out here. Uh, some people might also go to like the Civic Half Zip 28, which is both similar, more similar in size, rated size, and also kind of like form factor to that one. But this bag is my all-time favorite. It's got a lot more organization, superior EDC. You can easily rock this as a main EDC bag. Also does great in the outdoors. Also does great as a one bag travel and pretty much everything you can fit in the Dragonfly 30, you can fit in this one, even though this is rated nominally at 26 liters here. Uh, also available in a variety of fabrics, uh, nylon, uh, X-Pack, maybe the, only those two actually. <laughs> um, oh, actually I think there's also like a wax canvas and stuff there as well. Um, and then maybe the other downside, or another downside I mentioned this one, besides the fact that it's heavier, is like the fact that it's got multiple compartments can, um, it means it has a slightly worse like efficiency ratio, I would say, than the Dragonfly, but um, you know, still a good bag to check out. This is still probably number one. Dragonfly is coming in like number two, number three in my all time kind of current one bag travel rankings. Six Moons all day tr carry travel bag, Six Moons does adventure travel bags. This is also an ultra, also with the ultra mesh stretch. This one is the 30 liter version. Um, more organization and compartments, um, better EDC. You got a suitcase style opening, if I can find what I did with the zippers here. Um, and, you know, that makes for also very efficient packing. You also see some similarities here in terms of like the um, kind of retention systems. These are removable. Uh, it's a bigger, taller bag, much fussier, much strappier, less efficient capacity to size ratio, and a bit of a heavier bag despite the use of the um, ultra fabric, but that's also because they have a much better kind of um, load carriage system here. I haven't had a chance to like fully like test it out or whatever. Uh, they've got a little bit more of a rigid, uh, sorry, a little bit more of a different frame here, more rigid, but also I would say kind of similarly challenged with load transfers. They just have a much more robust load carriage system. I'll have a full review of this one in the coming months just because uh, I have a, a particular uh, adventure plan for testing this one out here. Different form factor altogether, but similarly, extremely lightweight. This is the Rofmia Shift uh, Daypack V2. Super lightweight. I think it's basically the same weight uh, as that one. Um, a different style, roll top style. I've, I've shown this in other kind of also considers. Uh, lots of like great affordances 
uh, a little bit more, I would say, organization. You also similarly have like, you know, quick access pockets. You have external access to the laptop compartment um, inside of here. You got external water bottle pockets, uh, a decent load carry system. Again, I think similarly, like there's limits on the kind of weight that you can carry. This one's much more expensive than the, um, and also usually out of stock. So you gotta watch carefully for when they come back in stock. This is from uh, one of my favorite Japanese manufacturers, Rof Mia. It's a very small, also a very small, um, you know, kind of cottage industry uh, up in Gifu, Japan, but definitely worth checking out if you can get your hands on this and you don't mind the roll top kind of style -y. And so that's it. If you have any questions about this bag, go ahead and leave those in the comments below. And if I can, I will answer them. If you have any bags you would like me to review, go ahead and leave those in the comments below. And if I can, I will review them. Thank you very much.